Why do I, why did I write so much in the area of law? So, it's not really because I think of law as some kind of universal. It's because I think that we respect the judgments that are made and in our way of life law differs from every other field of decision making of which I'm aware and I'm not aware of every um, that requires a logical explanation whether it makes sense or not. If you pass a law in the legislature, you just have to put a few whereases and something and who cares. When a judgment is made, they have to give you the reasons for the judgment. And it's in the reasons for the judgment that you find the pieces of ideology that are very central to the cultural understanding of what the phenomenon is about. So I was very interested in how the judges in the Calder decision, which was one of the first ones that dealt with Aboriginal rights, uh, <laughs> Aboriginal title in the recent years, 1973, how they reasoned about whether Indians had any rights before we showed up. What was their reasoning? What were their assertions? How did they come to these conclusions? There was a case, uh, Baker Lake uh, Inuit case, which if you work with Inuit, you ought to know. Um, if you don't, you ought to know it. It was a judgment in which they decided that the Inuit were, had, had a certain right to a, a, uh, an injunction, but along the way, they cho the judge chose to argue that the Inuit were so primitive that all they could do is hunt and fish and survive. And where did he get that conclusion from? Well, he dismissed, um, he shouldn't say that, he misread Milton Freeman's testimony in a certain kind of way. He refused to accept the um, authority of uh, Peter Usher to make any statements. And he found a judgment from 1919, which was all based in that 19th century evolutionary argument. Well, if it hadn't been a judgment, I wouldn't have known all that. What are the pieces that get together that enable him to feel comfortable in saying such a racist thing? What are the pieces? So that's why I like the law. It brings out what normally in the background. It forces the articulation of these things. I don't think law is a solution. Um, and what I've written is that law can only go so far, even in a case like Canada, because at the end of the day, it's nine people. And if the population really thinks that they've gone off the deep end. I don't care if they're considered elders or not. There'll be a revolution about it, and they won't, they won't follow it. So it's only good instruction, and it'll only go a certain distance. So that's what, how I feel about law, yeah. Future of anthropology. God, pun. Okay, future of anthropology. I'm really glad you asked me that, Harry, because... I have to I have to say that I'm kind of I'm truth I'm truth telling here it's a little bit I feel a little bit 
um, uncomfortable. Doesn't mean I'm not going to do it, but I want I want people to know that I feel very uncomfortable about this, because I have been very uncomfortable saying that, not saying no no. Saying that my discipline is anthropology for a really long time. Um, I have a, a history, which as I said at the beginning of our conversation, goes back to this radical period when I was growing up. And Margaret Mead, for example, recorded a record for my father. She was part of a progressive movement. Boaz was part of a progressive movement. Anthropology was part of a movement that was anti-racist, that was trying, I believe, really, really hard to do what it could do in the face of colonialism and racism. That's ultimately why I felt really comfortable going into it. I'm not at all arguing that all anthropologists were like that, because an awful lot weren't. But what I am arguing is that you could find a home with those kinds of values in anthropology. I talked about the argument between Marvin Harris and um, Margaret Mead. I'm personifying it. Of course, it was a much larger argument than that. And Solins was actually on the Marvin Harris, um, um, Mort Freed team. They were, they were, I'm not exactly sure what their politics were, but they were definitely in a different left than Margaret Mead or Conrad Ahrensberg and a whole bunch of other people. Then these books came out and you guys, and I don't know, because you, you don't maybe read the English literature the way that which people here read the English literature. And maybe you do, maybe you don't in France, I don't know. But two books came out which revolutionized the field and, in my opinion, did untold damage. And that those were Assad's book on colonialism, anthropology and the colonial encounter. Does that make sense to you guys? You don't, you know it? No? See, this is where the disconnect between the English language and the French language traditions is really, really profound. Because that book was absolutely central to changing. If you're sitting there in France and wondering what the hell happened to American anthropology, that's what happened to American anthropology or British social anthropology. And the second one is Del Himes's edited book called Reinventing Anthropology. And they both come out around 1969. So they come out in, after what happened at Columbia in 1968 and after what happened at the Anthropology Association meetings in 1968 and the attack that the older anthropologists were complicit in the war in Vietnam. Um, and so they decided to condemn them and look back at the history of anthropology through the lens that these were all handmaidens of colonialism. They were all trying for the colonial project. So Margaret Mead got recast this way. Boas got seriously recast this way. Um, Radcliffe Brown got recast. Like the, that whole canon 
And so the history of anthropology was reinscribed as though it were the history of colonial exploitation. That it was uh, an agent for colonial exploitation. Now, I don't, Assad's way more careful than that, so I'm not blaming him. Oh, I am blaming him because he never really did much, as far as I could see, to say, no, no, that's not what I mean. But he didn't actually say it quite like that. I'm overstating it, but. Um, so that's the anthropology that everyone younger than me has learned in the United States and in Britain. And so I don't know how it fits with what goes on in Quebec or what goes on in France, but that is very, very, very central. So I went to Oklahoma, like I said, not interested in being an anthropologist, interested in going out and being an activist and using my anthropology to that. Get called in to this graduate program because of the war, do the graduate program, get out, get heavily engaged in political stuff here, see myself as an anthropologist doing this kind of work and really happy that I was able at the University of Alberta to do this kind of work and still be able to progress as a professor. I mean, I thought that was pretty good. You know, like a lot of times they try to take people like me and, and marginalize them. But I didn't feel that that was happening with me at all. And I, and I thank them for that. Um, and it's, I mean, I did, I, I, my work is good. My, it's not like it was second rate research. It was just always directed politically somehow. Um, and so I didn't know all this stuff was going on. I left the United States. I left the center of all this, moved to Canada, moved to a place in the far away, but central to my political work, but certainly not in the heartland of this anthropological debate, theoretical debate. So I come back to it, and I discover this is going on. And... I then try to spend some time writing against it, um, especially about the way in which people were lionizing um, Julian Stewart, who, I don't know if you know his work, but Julian Stewart was a, a guy who wrote about, uh, um, he's the beginning of the cultural materialism argument, and he talks about uh, the role of of ecology and technology and shaping how people um, uh, live on the land and hunter-gatherers are very, very restricted, constrained, and so on. So it's, it's, it's a gruesome tale. But the part of the tale that's never told is that he gave that as evidence against the Shoshone in courts to try to get them to have their land rights annulled. And he lost that argument to another guy named Omar Stewart, who used the kinds of things that you're talking about, place names, culture, to so show that these people really were there. So who's remembered in the field? Julian Stewart, as the great anthropologist. And in the day when I was growing up, he was really marginal because everyone said, you're a jerk and you don't know what you're talking about. Now he's lionized. And I tried to publish something on that and I got creamed. I've never been creamed for anything I have written, but I was literally creamed for writing this kind of thing. I find that the students that I encounter are all enculturated into this myth that the 
first good anthropology happened after something called the reflexive moment. Is that a term that you guys have heard of? I mean, you know, you, you're like uncontaminated because the reflexive moment is like, the most important thing that in American anthropology, there was this moment when we finally realized that we were colonial assholes and we've changed our practices ever since. But consequently, we can't speak for natives, we can't do this, so, you, you know, so, there, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that we're not supposed to do because we were so bad in the past that we have to overcome now. And I find no connection with uh, with people who talk like that. I have a very hard time. I try to spend, I'm a patient person. I try to say it, but it's too big. It's too big a, um, it's too big a piece. It's too big a piece. But, so what about the future of anthropology? Well, first of all, there are always students who want to know something. And I'm very happy about them. By the way, I also think that the fact that they have taken this line, I've got, I've got to say this because otherwise it sounds like a, just a personal thing. Taking this line has been the worst, worst, I'm going to be say that, the worst thing that anthropology could have done. Because at the very moment that everyone is now saying it's really important to talk about indigenous issues. Anthropologists has said, we can't talk about it. That's our past and we were jerks. So we can't, we have nothing to say about it. Right. And they've, they've really cut themselves out of the most important dialogue about how to resolve things. Um, because that's the consequence. They, they, the people won't people won't engage in that, and they then they'll engage with it, and if then they do in such um, such a gingerly way that they that they don't seem to offer anything of great of great substance. It's a real. I mean, we could be doing so much. We could be doing so much now that so. I mean, just the kinship stuff, because these people. Or would be really interested in our views, not that they would say we're right and they're wrong, but they would say, oh, that's interesting, maybe we can work with that in some way. If we were still engaged in doing that kind of stuff, but we've kind of run away from all of that. All we write, I mean, what we write now is mostly either look how different these people are from us, or Look at how terrible colonialism was to these people. That seems to me to be the main topics. And I don't know how much future there is in, in that. I'd rather have the topic, obviously, that I think is important, which is how can we use anthropology to figure out how to better communicate um, and, and resolve issues. That, I would like to see that. Okay. So... The future of anthropology, I have said, and I, and I say uh, only kind of partly tongue-in-cheek, is in political science. Because they have the courage to really start taking up these issues. And they're now interested in culture and cultural difference and how that shapes political arrangements. But... I mean, I want to leave with some hope. We have a lot of possibilities to claim this space, but I wish we would become more reflective of, and for example, instead of saying someone like me is like out there and you know either ignore it or critique it, but take what I'm saying in a heartfelt way and try to, you know, work with the good parts of whatever it was that I was saying, because we do have an opportunity to create a kind of space that we had before, and people would be happy with it. But we need to work on it, because we're kind of in the wrong direction now, in my opinion. <laughs>